Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 14 of the Dungeon Lore series. In this series, I hope to expand upon things you might not know about Final Fantasy XIV dungeons, as well as discuss their individual stories and lore. Today's dungeon is the Wanderer's Palace. Prior to the Calamity, the mines of Ogomaru were used frequently by the kobolds of Lenoskia to harvest and refine precious materials. This involved the tunnelling of all the areas surrounding the mines, including that of the Bronze Lake of Upper Lenoskia. Due to this, the area underneath the lake became greatly weakened, and upon arrival of the Calamity, the resulting tremors collapsed the water of the lake into the tunnels, both flooding the tunnels and somewhat draining the lake in the process. This, however, revealed hidden in the depths a huge, stunning-looking palace. After some investigation, scholars and archaeologists deduced that the palace once belonged to the famous civilization of Nim. Known for the floating city present around the reaches of Lonoskia, this ancient place and its people were the known predecessors of the original inhabitants of what became Limsa Lominsa, and it has been strongly suggested that the civilization was ruled and largely populated by plainsfolk Lalafell. The palace discovered in Bronze Lake was built as a place of worship to Oshon, the Wanderer, hence the name the Wanderer's Palace. However, after its original use, it became a dark and dreary place, as a horrible disease plagued the population of Nim an illness which came to be known as the Green Death. This foul disease would cause sickness, and would eventually turn its victim to a Tonberry, a small green, tailed creature who are often seen wearing plain cloaks and wielding lanterns and knives. Adventuring and aspiring scholars will be familiar with the palace, after having investigated it for the secrets of the Nimian scholars, who seem to outstrip their modern-day counterparts by a great margin. Along with al -Kazolka, they give chase to a mysterious Tomberry, who, when surrounded, spots their long-lost fairy, their Lily, which dispels the madness surrounding them. The Tomberry reveals that he was once Sarito Kurito, a Nimian scholar from 1500 years prior. It is from Sarito Kurito we discover that the disease that came to be known as the Green Death originated at sea on a trading vessel, where as it spread, scholars were desperate to discover a cure for the horrible atrophic symptoms. He also informs us that the palace was used in the past as a place to keep the sick at bay by sealing any showing the signs within the place with powerful magics. The Warrior of Light, fresh off the back of saving Eorzea from the ultimate weapon, as well as the wrath of Lahabrea, find themselves speaking with Aleem, who tells of exciting treasures to be found within the palace. She directs us to Abazi Karazi, standing guard over a small boat at Bronze Lake. They tell us of the first venture they made with Aline and a band of friends. Seven of them entered, eager to find the treasures within, only to find naught but the Tomberries, the remnants of the Nimian people, still alive and hostile to any who approached. They slipped in the slime omnipresent throughout the floors, and then slipped in their comrades' blood. Aline, however, believes that the comrades are merely hiding within, and Abazi sends us forth to discover the fate of the missing explorers. The party enters the palace via Abazi's boat, and proceeds through the corridor leading to the silent garden. They catch a glimpse of another band of treasure hunters plundering the palace, and watch as they slay a Tomberry in their path. This causes more Tomberries to appear, which attack the party. The party fights to defeat them, however doing so causes an ominous presence to appear, in the form of an enormous, slow-moving Tomberry from near the entrance. This Tomberry slowly shambles towards the party, and upon entering a certain range will thrust its knife into the nearest party member, causing great damage to them. Continuing on, the party encounters creatures that have made the newly surfaced corridors their home, buzzards and beetles alike, as well as more tomberries dotted along the way. The tomberries throughout this dungeon are often seen patrolling the hallways, slowly moving along with their lanterns. The party proceeds through the next area, where several more beetles attack them, and they then defeat the insect-like gear grease and cog oil enemies before reaching the open area known as Still Waters. 
we come across a Gubu here known as the Keeper of Haladum, a word now obsolete in English, usually referring to a sanctuary or holy place. As this was a palace dedicated to Oshon the Wanderer, we can assume that the creature is a protector of the inner workings of the place, or a warden to keep the deadly green death sealed within. During the fight, the Gubu tries to inhale anything in front of it, pulling party members in close. Each time it does so, it releases its moldy phlegm upon any nearby. This causes any afflicted to receive a reduction in the power of their healing magic. It also attempts to do the same with a moldy sneeze, the difference being a targeted attack on a party member. Upon defeat, the party can proceed onward and activate the Nimian device next to the closed doors. This device acts as a windlass style mechanism, opening the doors and allowing the party into the long hall. We catch a glimpse of the inner workings of some of the mechanisms within the place, with the crumbling wall showing large gears placed inside. The party defeats more Tom Murrays, some of whom from this point will drop a portion of the oil used in their lanterns, which the party can collect for use later in the palace. As we proceed up the set of stairs here, there is an embossed carving on the wall of the symbol representing Oshon the Wanderer. After defeating the enemies at the top of the stairs, the party finds two rusted Nimian devices. We must use the lantern oil received from the nearby Tomberries to lubricate the device, allowing it to be turned. The next room contains the most sprawling part of the palace, known as the Endless Rise. Here the party must locate four more Nimian devices, some of which require yet more lantern oil, in order to open the doors on the far side and proceed. Lurking within the halls are more of the large Tomberries we saw chase us at the start of the area, and once again these must be avoided if the party does not want to meet a grim fate. The enemies within the area here are the unfortunate souls who remained trapped within the palace over 1500 years ago, either as skeletons or as the floating, corrupted entities reduced to their soul alone. The architecture within the room also stands out, as several pulley-like systems appear to be rotating from the depths underneath the palace, perhaps once retrieving fresh water or valuable minerals. However, Several of them sit broken or motionless, possibly due to the damage caused by water or the calamity. The party defeats the Tomberries standing guard in the area, and uses the lantern oil to once again loosen up the rusted devices, which in turn opens the doors towards the final ease. Passing the water wheels, we discover a giant Bavarar blocking our path. During this fight, the Bavarar uses its arms to flail at the tanking party member, causing heavy damage. It also calls forth several smaller Bavarar to attack the party. The purple Bavarar casts thunder spells and inflicts paralysis. The green Bavarar inflicts a small damaging debuff and casts aero spells. The white Bavarar uses blizzard spells and causes party members to move slowly. And the blue Bavarar simply casts water spells. One thing the party must be wary of is that the giant Bavarar will keep summoning its minions, even if the previous ones are still alive. Upon defeat, the door towards the back of the room opens and the party can proceed. The party enters the final corridor of the palace. We defeat the enemies located here, including more of what we've seen already, Nimian people long lost to corruption or death, and several more Tomberries, some of whom give yet more lantern oil. Reaching the top of the stairs, the party uses the oil to open the final set of devices and enter into the Shantry, where another threat awaits. The so-called Tomberry King appears, sharpening his knife on the brim of his lantern and turns to face the party. During this fight, along with using his knife on party members similar to the other Tomberries, the Tomberry King uses its Scourge of Nim, which heavily damages any stood within it and slows them greatly. Many small Tomberries appear from the edges of the arena, however these must be dealt with carefully, as upon death they release their rancor which empowers the King. The king will cast everybody's grudge, which damages party members more if the Tomberries have been slain. When injured, several larger Tomberries appear, the Tomberry Slashes. These act similarly to the large patrolling Tomberries from earlier in the dungeon, however instead of walking steadily towards party members, they move in intermittently, 
but in large distances. If they are left alive too long, however, they start bombarding party members with their own Scourge of Nim. Upon defeat, the Tomberry collapses to the floor and vanishes. And that's the end of the story and lore of the Wanderer's Palace. A foray into a palace turned prison, with discoveries of an ancient race of people in some ways more advanced than our own. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more Final Fantasy XIV lore. And please let me know uh, if there's anything extra I can put into the videos that might you know, be a bit more accessible for everyone to look at. Maybe some location names, maybe some other cutscenes and stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm always looking for feedback, so please let me know. Uh, and I'll catch you next time for Amdapur Keep.